We're good. Good over there? Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. Roll call. Commissioner Allen? Here. Commissioner Atwater? Here. Commissioner Christofferson is excused. Commissioner Griffin? Here. Commissioner Treza? Here. Vice Chair Duffy? Present. Chair Burkett? Here. You do have six commissioners present. It does constitute a quorum. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we have the consent calendar. Do we have uh, anybody want to pull any of the items or a motion to approve? I would move to pass the consent calendar as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. Now we have an informational present. We have an informational item on the uh, third quarter. Uh, Fiscal year financial statements. De Jesus. Thank you. So, Michelle Bowling, our director of finance and county, will be <clears throat> covering that with your PowerPoint. Thank you. Sure. Good afternoon. Uh, today, I'll be presenting the board's year to date financial highlights for March 31st, 2022. Thank you. You know, I struggle with these, so you might stand by. <laughs> Um, operating revenues are, well, see, I told you, stand by. Thank you. Operating revenues are $9.1 million or 21.6% over budget and $14.4 million or 38.8% over last year for the same time period. Waterborne tonnages have increased 6.1% from the last year with the increases in general cargo of 169.9% and liquid bulk cargoes of 5.6% with offsetting decreases in dry bulk cargoes of 5.4%. As compared to budget, general and dry bulk cargoes are over budget by 113.2% and 5.3% respectively while liquid bulk cargoes are 15.2% under budget. General cargo revenues increased 130.7% and are 165% over budget. This is a result of an increase in a variety of commodities. Bagged rice is uh, 57.09 metric tons or 146.4% over budget. The increase in rice tonnage is a result of several factors, including the Port of Stockton receiving several spot market shipments of imported rice of import rice and reduced labor availability at the Port of West Sacramento caused by an ILWU imposed travel ban of their members. This has caused cargo to temporarily be redirected to the Port of Stockton and this has resulted in $660,000 more, $660, of more revenue than budgeted. Steel tonnages are over budget by 97.6% and $2.7 million in revenue. Delays in Southern California and the issues facing the container market have resulted in additional cargoes being routed through Stockton. Bagged animal feed tonnages are 185.9% above budget with 613,000 more in revenue than budgeted. Due to backlogs at container ports, there is a strong demand for alternative shipping methods. Animal feed typically is a containerized cargo. It is now being moved out of containers and shipped as break bulk. The backlogs at container ports are also bringing in other unbudgeted cargoes to Stockton via alternative shipping methods, and these include wood products, auto parts, and pet resin. These cargoes added an additional $958,000 in revenue. Uh, to the port's income statement. Bag sugar, a new line of business, was added in the third quarter, adding 29,000 metric tons and $332,000 in revenue. Dry bulk revenues are $1.7 million over budget and $1.5 million more than the previous year at this time. Low sulfur coal tonnages are greater than budget by 59.8% with $1.5 million more in revenue. Dry bulk fertilizer tonnages are above budget by 34.6, with 63,000 more revenue than budgeted, due mainly to the timing of shipments. Mineral sands, a new unbudgeted export that came to the port beginning in the second quarter, brought an additional 105,000 metric tons, 
with 714,000 in additional revenues. Conversely, cement and slag tonnages are under budget by 23.4% with 970,000 less revenue than budgeted. The shortfall is due to high ocean freight rates that have reduced demand as well as shipping delays on the West Coast. Liquid bulk revenues are 568,000 or 10.1% under budget, but are up 394,000 or 8.4% as compared to the previous year. Tonnages are over budgeted for um, over budget for food grade oil and molasses while tonnages are under budget for liquid fertilizer all attributable to timing of shipments the port budgeted a new commodity in FY 2022 uh, renewable diesel which is still a project in development but did see a shipment totaling 9500 metric tons and the tenant is working on this project the tenant working on this project is working through new regulations related to um, necessary tenant leasehold improvements. Property management revenues are 7.9% or $1.8 million over budget. Lease revenue is 796,000 or 4.8% over budget. Building occupancy is currently at 95% with 100% allocation and a wait list for future availabilities. There are approximately 400 acres of readily available land to be developed. Rail uses feeds Fees are $1.2 million or 77.1% over budget and 91.7% over uh, the prior year at this time. All right. Let's see if I can, oh, see, see how I am? Thank you, Shafa. One more, thank you. Wages and fringe benefits are 758000 or a negative 5 point or 5.2 under budget and are 558,000 more than last year at this time. Wages and fringes are under budget as there are several positions and uh, several budgeted and vacant positions yet to be filled. Environmental expenses are 46.1% over budget and down uh, $1 million from last year. West Complex remediation efforts have intensified over the last 21 months due to uh, one new tenant and another potential tenant with large projects. And these projects require high levels of coordination with DTSC and the Regional Water Quality Control Board in order to keep the project development on schedule. Outside services and consultants expenses are $526,000 under budget and $94,000 more than last year. With this, within this category, consultant expenses, $381,000 under budget due to timing of projects. Utility and telephone expenses are 6.2 over budget. This is due uh, to increased usage of natural gas by one of the port's larger users. Port promotion and commissioner's expense are $801,000 under budget, but 23.4% more than the previous year. Uh, a lot of this is due to COVID. Uh, we were able to travel a little bit more last year, but not as much as we had initially planned. All other expenses, uh, materials and supplies, uh, pro promotional expenses, et cetera, are a mixture of higher and lower costs. And overall operating expenses, including depreciation, are 2.1 million or 6.7 over budget, up 15.4% from last year. Michelle, did you talk about the increase on the contract in Steve Adoring? Did I miss that? <sighs> I, may, I may have accidentally overlooked that. Volume Contracted Stephen Orton, yes, would be up just be, because of sheer volume. And the, and the largest uh, contributor to that is we've gotten so much more general cargo, which is more labor intensive. That is, that is the cause of that giant leap there. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. The next one, please, Sean. Unrestricted cash as of uh, March 31st was 31.9 million, a decrease of 2.6 million uh, since June 30, 30, uh, 30th of 2021. Uh, the days of cash at March 31st was 259, a decrease of 36 days from June. Now currently, um, as of today, um, our cash is higher. Um, we are at $35.7 million, which equates to 290 days of cash. So since the end of the quarter, we've increased our days of cash by 31 
days. And so Michelle, I yeah. know that that's a goal we established many years ago. I don't know right. when we established it, how it was established, but I'd be very interested in upcoming meetings if you could present to us what you feel we should be hanging on to now. Okay. And best practices within the industry. Okay. I know we could have a discussion on that because I think we could look to the appropriate number should be in there for a goal set. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that we're all comfortable. And it might just stay the same, but I'd like to have us all address it. Okay. So we just talked about this uh, in the budget ad hoc. Um, and so, but yeah, policy is 360. It's, I don't know if that's a goal, it's policy, but something another, we need to address. Another equivalent for it's there a year plus. So I guess if that's if you're looking for a comparative number, I guess the other ports, um, that's what they look at. But that's a good place to start. That doesn't mean it's the best for everybody, but that might be what the school is doing all together. And, and that was, yes, and that was an extensive subject. Yeah, we just spent a little bit of time on that, so. The number was set as a very optimistic goal when it was set. But yeah, we were right. nowhere near that no, at that the, time. Yeah. And so the last few years, we've experienced significant increases to, to get this close. Mr. Harum? Yeah, could I just add from a historical perspective, not yes, a legal you could. one? Yes, sure. Uh, is, is that one factor that was important when, when I was a commissioner and we were discussing this? is that we are a unique port in that we're an old port, but at the same time we were trying to build a new port with new infrastructure and trying to balance how much money you're going to spend, you know, you spend, you have to spend money to make money, how much you're going to spend on improving the infrastructure of the new port versus having the reserves that ports that are fully built out have. And that was one of the tensions that we dealt with at that time. It still exists. It still exists, yes. We are, we are the most unique port in California because of the fact we're both an old port and a new port. Yeah, with the West Complex. Exactly. Yeah. And we don't generate tax revenue like some of the others do. So there's a lot of variables in there. There, 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 there are a lot of competing, a lot of competing interests going into determining the right number. I'm glad we're having the discussion. Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess my, just to follow up on that, I, was, I, I don't know, we're, we're not going to get a report. Are you going to give a report on the budget committee yet? Uh, we, there we can talk about it now or yeah. during the go-round, whatever you prefer. Well, it's, it's, it seems relevant now because we're talk, having this conversation. If there's anything so you want to add. Where we wound up was we acknowledged that um, it may not be the right number, but we don't know. But in any event, the fact that we're not <clears throat> in compliance with that number, we're going to have a footnote every time we publish a report. So it's acknowledged that we know we're not compliant. If we change the number, it'll be different. But for now, <clears throat> we'll acknowledge it and explain what's causing it. Basically, it's Right. Big infrastructure yeah. to, to, to Steve's point, historically, have we ever had 360 days? No, I haven't had it. It hasn't been since I, I've been I think on. we did. I think at one time we did. Yeah, I think yeah. we did. Um, time. Michelle, I don't know if you remember that. Before. Maybe for a very brief Very short period. Very short time. time. Yeah, very right. short We didn't have a party that day? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't invited anyway. Yeah. <laughs> put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> now we started building that bridge or something. But, but I, I think it's a good point, because considering yeah. how much, how many, many projects we have, infrastructure projects, deferred maintenance, it really doesn't mean much if we save it just for the sake of saying, oh, look, we have this cash and we're not making some of the investments that we we're think we need to. And, fr so. and frankly, if we would have spent the money back then, instead of hitting 360 days for that brief period back, it, we would have done those infrastructure projects for a lot less uh, exactly regulatory <laughs> and compliance and, and overhead so true. costs. I agree 100%. So we'd probably be there today. Yes. yes. If it was yeah, that there's inflation. <laughs> no, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's transitory. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think we're all in agreement on that. And, I, and, and if inflation is as bad as it is, the last thing we want to do is be sitting on yeah. the market. Just remember, this was a goal. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's all it is, is yep. a goal. And it was the correct thing to do at the time. Yeah. But Definitely. You have to address it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, does anybody have any other questions of Michelle while she's here? So, Michelle, I'm, I'm really interested in areas that are sticky that might have been realized because of the crisis and the change in environments, 
which either meant that we have new cargo coming in and now that's going to be sticky. Not, not the things that were bounced up because it was just an event, right? But the things that are sticky both on the income side and the expense side. So anything that you can kind of uh, feather out there that means these are really, truly new lines of business that we could expect to continue into the future. I'd be very interested in, or cost savings, that yes, commissioners didn't travel as much, and then you had, <laughs> but real cost savings that are sticky, that we might have found a better way to do things during COVID that we could uh, capitalize on now. Um, and just to follow up on that, I was, if we could go up to the, the first slide you had on, uh, the revenue. I, it just kind of struck me at how much off we were off from our uh, from our budget. And and if you looked at, I mean, nine million versus we were expecting three point six. You know, and uh, I don't think the thought was that the surplus was going to continue that, that yeah. we saw. You know, back the year before. So so it's a more realistic budget on on historically what we've seen without the thought that the supply chain crisis was going to continue and benefit us like it has. Yeah. yeah. But it does, doesn't seem like running. our costs went up by that much. You would think that logically if the Variable driving, costs should yeah. move in. You think. But well, with Stephen Steve Steve costs went way up. I know. Yeah. But we still, we're still making, we still made a lot more. So was that due to mix of product? What, what, That's and what is sticky? That, I, all I care about is sticky, right? Yeah, what's going to yeah. stay after the crunch? Yeah, yeah. We can, Jason and I will get something together operationally and, and what we think we'll, we'll see. I mean, obviously we've seen commodity come out of containers to, you know, 30, 35% more, but what are... But that might not back? be long-lasting, right? Correct. I mean, I, I some, changed some it be. for an emergency, not because I'm changing my whole log logistics. Right, but the, the diversity mix we're pushing now, some of those that we've gotten were independent of COVID. Well, mm -hmm. it benefited right. to move here, but I think we'll see those sticks, so we'll, we'll put together a list for you. Good. Because some of those logistics issues in Southern California are caused by a lot of things, regulatory issues in Cal within California, mm -hmm. some of which we're dealing with here. So they are going, I think some of that's going to stick because they're, they're dealing with huge inefficiencies down in SoCal that are going to stay. Mm -hmm. Regardless. Trucks can't get into the ports. Regardless, so, yeah. yeah, exactly. Not enough truck drivers, and the truck drivers can't reach the port because you have to have the you know, interim transport. Okay. Anything, uh, good Good discussion, uh, Any anything else anybody wants to add? Okay, thank you, Michelle. Well, um, She's not done. I wasn't yeah. done. Michelle's got more to add. Just okay. take a bow, drop the mic, and walk. <laughs> I thought no, that was good news I, to end on. <laughs> I did want to um, add um, just for some historical context. Um, the cash and reserve policy was initially um, adopted in July of 2007, where we had a cash goal at that time of 120 to 150 days, and it was increased to 360 in January of 2019. Just a fun fact, which is okay. kind of a sad so fun fact. we hit it when it was only 100 days. No, no, no I think we did hit three, we 360, 360 for a short period of time. A little bit of time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. A little moment of worry. Like prepping up for the great recession. Yeah. <laughs> and then just, just to highlight the capital projects we've been working on so far this year, um, we've had net capital assets increase by $9.1 million. So far this year, the port's invested $18.4 million in capital assets. Um, most notably, the five avenue grade separation, um, 3.9 this year. The, the project was larger than that, but this was the portion that was attributable this, to this year. The Lee Bear Crane and attachments was 3.8, but that was contributed for the most part. There was a small amount that the port paid cash for. Um, dredging projects totaled 1.7. The McCloy Road improvements was 1.2. And the West Complex levy improvement was 1.1. That project was in coordination with Reclamation District 403. And some of that funding, a good chunk of that funding, we are expecting to be returned to the port in a subsequent fiscal year, so through a state program. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. Any Any other questions this time? Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on to number six, uh, consideration and possible approval for the port director to execute the amended agreement for the Mandeville Island dredge placement site and approve the payment of 198000 to Mandeville Island. Okay, Jeff Winkfield, our deputy uh, port director, is going to address this. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, 
as you all know, the uh, the Corps of Engineers and the federal government, they, they pay for the maintenance dredging of the ship channel every year. Uh, as the non-federal sponsor, one of the port's requirements is to go out and find placement sites uh, up and down the channel for the Corps to place material there. And then we also have to uh, maintain those sites, make sure that there's capacity in them every year. Um, so I wanted to, uh, one of the agreements that we have and one of the areas that's, that's a, of concern for us is kind of the middle of the channel right there. So the area that we're responsible for is from Antioch on the west all the way to, to the Port of Stockton's east complex. The bright orange or the bright yellow uh, mark right in the middle of the screen is a site that we have uh, been working on for some time. Um, you can see there's, there's kind of a void there in the middle and a lot of times that's where we have our, our uh, channel depth uh, at its shallowest and the, uh, the draft that's, that, is, that covers uh, or that is our minimum for the entire channel. So we've, we've been working hard uh, on, the, on the west side of the, the dredge place, of the west side of the channel. We've got um, agreements with the federal government. We've got agreements with the state government. And then we also have port-owned property over there. And on the eastern end, we've got all port-owned property that we can control. But in that middle area, we've really struggled in finding dredge placement sites. So what we did uh, probably about 10 years ago, we worked with Mandeville Island to be able to put material there. One of the issues, there's a lot of wetlands and a lot of ag out on that island. And so they didn't want to put dredge material in specific areas, and the areas that they did want to put it were very small, very small pockets of land. Typically, we like 10 to 20 acres at minimum. This site, I believe, is about five acres. And so in order to make that work, what we have to do is go out there every year, remove the material, relocate it to another site on the island uh, to create capacity for the following year. It's challenging, but uh, in order to get the channel dredged, that's what, that's what we've had to do. So the port pays for those costs every year, and it's, it's, it's really difficult to get to the site. So in order to get heavy equipment across, we've got to do a bridge inspection. They've got a private bridge there. Uh, we have to survey the site, um, pre- and post-dredge survey, and then remove the material. What the owner of the property has come back with, and, and we've been telling them, this is not sustainable for us. We don't do it like this for anywhere else. We do need dredge material sites in this area, so we tried to. We made a an exception, um, but it's not sustainable. So what they've done is they've come back and said, "Okay, we will we'll take ownership. We'll, we will move the material at ten dollars per yard, um, and then that's that cost will escalate fifty cents per yard for the next five years. Uh, in the meantime, we're also looking at dredge material sites." across the ship channel. We're working with folks at Venice Island. We're working with folks on Mandeville or at uh, McDonald Island to set up additional sites to try to, to move away from, from Mandeville. But for the time being, we've got to, uh, to work with this, these groups if we want to dredge that area. So last year, we put 19,000 yards in, into their site. So with this agreement in place, if you approve, we would pay $190,000 to remove that material, pay them and they would remove the material. Mm -hmm. And then we would enter into this new agreement moving forward where we'll pay $10 per yard and depending on how much material, I don't, I don't think we can get more than 20,000 yards into this site in any one year, it's, it's pretty small. So that's an estimate. That's an estimate, yes. It's gonna depend on weather conditions, it's just gonna depend on how much dredging needs to be done um, within the site. And like I said, we are trying and we are in negotiation with folks with Venice Island that's right across the ship channel and folks with McDonald Island that's a little further down that could take the place as well. How much distance are you allowed between where they dredge and where the site is? I mean, you've got them fairly well spaced all through the channel. Yeah, that's one thing that we, we, we struggle with as well because they can put in booster pumps. Um, uh, but the contractor really pushes hard against that because it's not as efficient for them. Um, so typically, it's a, a few miles is how far they can pump. I think it's about 20,000 feet max. Is it mostly, is it composed of sand mostly, you think? or is that, that It is most, so it's really sandy as you get on the west end of the, the dredge, uh, the dredge, the channel. The further east you get, it gets a little more silty and fine. So in that area, it's, it's kind of a mix. 
And so what most of the, the islands out there want to use it for is for, for levee stabilization, backfill. And so that's really good material for, for that application. Um, but for these guys, they have to move it around quite a bit, and it's, yeah. it can be expensive to, to do that. We've seen costs pretty high. Yeah. So, Jeff, about five years ago, there were a, a couple folks coming to us asking us to purchase an island out there to put dredge on and to do a visitor center or something also that they were trying to do. Is that, uh, that, that wouldn't have anything to do with this need, would it? I believe you're referring to Hog or Spud Island? It's yeah. one of the two of those, yeah. I yeah. couldn't remember which one it was. So, it's, so if you see the, the yellow dot to the right, the yellow triangle to the right of Mandeville, the one closest to the port, that is a property that we already own. That's um, Thule Island, and, and adjacent to that are uh, Fern and Headreach, which we own. And Spud is, is right. Spud's between that uh, yellow dot and the red. So it... It, it wouldn't, wouldn't be a benefit. Any solution to it would not. This. No, not for this. No. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and I have a question of, of Steve. Should we, should we approve it like this, or should we say ten dollars a cubic foot, not to exceed X? Would they have to? If this is an estimate, I mean, is that something that we should? They don't, they don't have to come back if it turns out if it's twenty thousand plus. Well, I think what we put in the, the memo was to agree to the, the one-time the one -time payment for this year of, of 198000 and then to authorize the port director to execute the agreement. And going forward, it would be $10 a yard. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. I thought you said this was an estimate, this, this payment. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Is there a I'll move motion? I'll approve. Second. Okay. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Thank you, Mr. Wingfield. And uh, let's move on to committee reports. Mr. Duffy? I will give mine in closed session. Okay. Mr. Outwater? Committee reports? Uh, I'd just like to comment that the uh, for the budget meeting, the staff was well prepared, with lots of information. There was a good discussion, um, and we hope to uh, move on to great resolution for the benefit of the port. Good, thank you. Steve, none this time. Okay, none. none. Bill, David spoke for us. Ditto. Okay, and then on my part, uh, we'll go to the port director's comments. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you guys just got the shipping activity report. Um, covered that. I think Michelle covered a lot of of where we are on that. We're a 29% increase uh, on vessel calls uh, year over year. We're, we're looking at a lot more steel tonnage. Uh, we're seeing that in torque tubes uh, as well as um, project cargo. So other than that, we expect the cargo that we are getting to remain pretty steady through probably through next calendar year, it sounds like. So that's, the, that's what we're basing our numbers on. We have a couple lease, uh, actually they're license agreements. So what we've done is uh, started looking at laydown space because we are so busy. Um, so we have license agreements for the, this laydown space. Uh, three of them signed with Ramsey. They're three months, February through April, um, which is so the retroactive. Um, and 4.2 acres at 87.50 uh, per month. And then we have uh, in the 700 yard. That's four and a half acres at 24,375. And then. Um, a south pad at three acres at 12,500. So that's 136,875 that we should, that we're receiving uh, for the 90 day agreements on those. Are those, are those paved? Some are paved and some are not, correct, Jason? That's correct, yeah, it's a combination of uh, hard dirt. Uh, slightly improved? Too improved. <laughs> and obviously trucks can get on them, yeah. Yeah. Through the winter. I think so. You're you assuming we're going to get rain get again, off. David. Well, those are complete. So those are 90-day <laughs> agreements that were, that were complete. So. That's uh, pretty good. We have another one on the, on the West Complex, five acres at um, $200,000 per uh, per year plus security deposit. That's a, a one-year starting June 1st through. Those unfenced, unlighted, just a five-acre piece of part. Yeah. yeah, it's storage and staging for, uh, for batteries. Wow. Uh, that yeah. one's paved, though, I think, correct? Yeah, that's correct. That's the... Uh, that's paved? The, 
we call him Tank Pad. Steve, uh, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11 Pad. 11 Pad. <laughs> Just uh, <laughs> east of the Denmark facility. The east of yeah. Pad. No fence or anything, or is there? Is there? No, it falls. It's in the, the, the port secure, secure area. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, uh, the other one we just signed was uh, a lease with BWC. Um, this is five years for um, track 820, so it's 36,000 per acre per year, and that starts June 1st, and that's uh, five years, as I said. And then we have a small one. I don't know if you guys have seen it by the uh, west entrance. There's a hot dog cart now. So uh, we're, we're leasing 120, no, 120 square feet of land. Well, how many free hot dogs do we get? I, none yet. I, I need yeah. to talk to the guys. So. We, can't, uh, we can't be fed at these meetings? Uh, <laughs> soda each day? That's it for me. Not, okay. Thank you. Any other questions of uh, Kirk? Okay. Seeing none, uh, commission comments. Mr. Duffy. None at this time, sir. Thank you. Oh, Steve. just a little clarification. Michelle touched on the travel ban. What happened was there was a pretty big outbreak of COVID about six to eight months ago in Southern California. So the Pacific Maritime Association and the LWU decided that ah, we got to protect the big dog, right? So they it did impose a travel ban. What that means is if you are a member in Stockton, you work in Stockton. If you're a member in uh, Oakland, you stay in Oakland. So this port and director understands this we depend on when we get really heavy we depend on travelers to come down from the other ports to help us out they get travel pay and so it's, it's a great thing for everybody but it did put a strain on us for a while there they just lifted it not too long ago about six weeks ago yeah, that's why we benefited from rice too because west sac didn't right. have that because they we, they we couldn't have that stock and couldn't travel to sacramento and vice versa so i just thought i'd clarify that Thank you. So hopefully things stay good. Thank you. Two items. First of all, I really would congratulate staff on the annual report. And this, to me, I think is the, probably the yeah. best one, cleanest one, it's easiest nice. reading, yes. full of information in the time that I've been on the commission. Yeah, Phenomenal right. report. And I hope you get awards for it because it it's a very, very good presentation. The other one kind of hit me as I was driving out from the state of the city on, two, on uh, Thursday last week was looking at the amount of acreage that we have and of course the wind was blowing really hard Thursday with dry grass on it. Now I didn't bring this up in our consent calendar because that not the plan we approved really doesn't cover that area or we don't fit under that because we don't have power lines that are affecting that area. But it really seems like there's a potential fire hazard out there with these grass these grassy areas and the amount of industrial traffic that goes around it. I think if we sit and just hope that it doesn't catch on fire, we're probably not being very wise. Was that on port land or outside the West port complex? Land? West complex. Well, yeah. the port has a plan. It was approved and reviewed by our by our fire marshal. Yeah, but that's a, that's state. in the consent calendar. But that really is focused on utility lines. And in this area, there really aren't utility lines yeah. running. This is this is you know. You're asking for the land. part of disaster recovery that would address that, or yeah. you know, yeah, just grass lines. So I don't know what's been what thought has been given to that in the past or whatever, but it was something as I was driving out there, I could just imagine something sparking somewhere near a railroad track or a roadway on the west side, and then the wind blows it through through a lot of open area, particularly on the west side, that's got nothing but dry grass on it. Well, the county used to require by the end of May, if you had that kind of property, you had to chop it down I, yeah, I don't know if that applies to us I know I, I know we have to deal with that on Any properties that we own that's why I say usually yeah. you get some kind of notice yeah, yeah. but if we're I don't governing we, I ourselves don't that to us. yeah then maybe we can have I want to take a look at, at that it. address yeah. it. that's a good address point yeah. yep okay yeah, thank we you do, we certainly have our fire marshal address it right yes yeah good point Jay. Bill. No. he just left that's everything that's a couple of comments number one I did attend the State of the City. Um, people really appreciate the port hosting it. I know it's going to get dicier to keep hosting it. But it was a positive event. Jay did a great job. He should be on TV. <laughs> and I noticed when I drove out, I've driven a lot on the island uh, for different reasons. And Davis Road is terrific. 
must have been repaved. And the first right turn by the firehouse, that always had a five foot pothole you had to, avoid. all that's been repaved. It's uh, kind of nice to drive on it. It's good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Save me some ball bearings. Here. Yes. Darn it. Sorry. <laughs> That it? Yeah. And I just wanted to thank Jay for stepping in uh, at the State of the City. I heard you did a great job uh, Beth, as well. Me. I know. I, we, 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 <laughs> you get sick and I we, 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 It was hot potato for a while there. And I was like, and, uh, and I, you, Jay. yeah, I think by all accounts, I think everybody, I talked to many people and they said you did a great job. And well, I forgot to introduce the, the video. Well. So apologize, Kirk. You had that on the speech and, and I forgot to introduce the video at the end. So. No, that's okay. I, I, I appreciate that too. It was last minute. And uh, also just wanted to comment that uh, Commissioner Trez and I went to uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, I wanted to comment that Jeff and Jason, Kirk was sick. He couldn't make the trip as well. But Jeff and Jason were there and they represented the port very well. We had a couple meetings that were outside of what were the normal wells, normal meetings. I think they did a good job and it was a worthwhile trip. And I think the port, uh, was also appreciated as well. We host that dinner and everybody was appreciative uh, of that as well. Comments, positive comments, so. Yeah. Uh, so with that, I think we'll move on to public comments. Do we have any None, public no comments? No online comments. So we have no public comments at this time, but Mr. Harum, you wanted to make a comment on a non-agenda item? Yeah, thank you, Chairman, for recognizing me. I just want to introduce the newest member of our legal team, John LeBurk, who's in the back there with the red tie. Uh, you may, some of you may know John, he was city attorney for 12 years. He retired in February and joined our firm in May, and he will be helping me on court matters and will probably be sitting uh, here on, on, in, on those rare occasions when I'm unable to sit with you. But I did want to introduce him and give him a chance to observe uh, the commission in action before he started working on, on port matters. So that's thank you dangerous. for that opportunity. Give him yeah. that opportunity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 12 years, that's a... That's a record. Yes, she lied. She lied 12 years as a city attorney, that alone. That's major. <laughs> Good job. Okay, with that, we'll go into closed session. In 1845, when Charles Weber acquired a 49,000-acre parcel from his luckless business partner in exchange for paying off his grocery bill, he couldn't have anticipated what awaited him three years later. During the gold rush, Argonauts could come to Stockton en route to what were known as the Southern Mines, but the principal um, artery for transportation and the fastest way to travel was via water. There was no Stockton in those early days. There was Charles Weber's tent town on the San Joaquin River that served as a jumping off point for the gold fields. He realized that the San Joaquin River was going to be the principal aid in developing his city and Charles Weber was able to attract enough business people to establish hotels and restaurants and freight companies, and they would cater to the wants and needs of the miners. Uh, those who did not make their fortune, uh, in many instances, had been farmers in their previous lives. And coming back into Stockton or Sacramento, took a look around the Central Valley and realized there was great agricultural potential. in San Joaquin County, this is the most productive agricultural area really in the world. You grow corn, wheat, almonds, walnuts, fruit, a whole host of different commodities feeding the world. You couldn't have the unique agricultural environment we have without the river. That is what allowed this state to, to turn from a gold mining state, if you will, uh, to a food state. California's Central Valley is blessed with the best soil there is. 
back then, the problem was less about growing the food than it was getting it to market. Without a statewide railroad system or even decent roads, Stockton was in a strategic position to be a hub, connecting the valley by river to San Francisco. From gold rush days, riverboats carried passengers and cargo on a daily basis between Stockton, Sacramento, and San Francisco. With the Central Pacific Railroad's completion of a branch line in 1869, connecting Stockton with the Transcontinental Railroad, the city's vision as a trade and transportation hub began to materialize, except for one critical issue. There were rather tortuous waterways leading from San Francisco to Stockton, weaving and turning through the islands. And because of hydraulic mining, there was a lot of sedimentation of these river areas, and so it was becoming rather shallow. In addition, ships were getting larger with deeper drafts, leaving the river's shallow depth a barrier to ocean-going vessels. If the region was going to grow with the times, it had to tame the twisting passage through the delta. Even though no single individual gets credit for proposing a dredged shipping channel, it was Lieutenant Colonel Barton Stone Alexander who drew up the plan in 1870 that showed it was feasible. They kind of choked at the projected $8 million price tag of such a ship canal. And so it continued to be a festering problem for the city of Stockton being cut off from that ocean-going transportation. Other countries hungered for California products, not just grains, nuts, and cotton, but manufactured goods too. The opportunity for trade was undeniable. When a product moves and how it moves is all dependent on where the destination is. The ship behind me is actually loading rice that's going to Japan. Rice would not be able to get to Japan if it didn't use port facilities because it doesn't make the economic sense to ship the kind of tonnage that one ship can hold in another way, like say, maybe in an aircraft. Stockton's residents remained convinced their future lay in a navigable ship channel. So in 1925, they passed a $3 million bond toward its construction. The state and feds later added more funds that finally set the project in motion. Work began in 1930. Dredges began removing millions of cubic yards of river bottom. Clamshell dredges piled the mud and rock to make levees that formed the new channel, opening acres of Delta Islands for farmland. Despite the Great Depression and Hitler's rise in Germany, in Stockton, church bells rang and automobile horns blared. It was 1933, and more than a thousand people celebrated the arrival of the Daisy Gray, the first deep draft vessel to arrive at Stockton's new port using the new channel. It was the start of a new era. The local responsibility was to develop the facilities. So they developed the docks, the warehousing, the rail connection, many of which we're actually still using today. In my opinion, uh, rail facilities are just as important to the success of a port as a dock. Central California Traction Company has been in business for more than 100 years. We are a uh, small railroad that basically does all the railroad switching on the Port of Stockton, and we're going all day long. We get rail cars from two major railroads, Burlington Northern and Union Pacific, and we get those cars, separate them all out, take them to the customers, let them unload them or load them, and then take them back and give them to those class one railroads. The port is a busy place. And you've got ships coming in, they've got trucks coming in, and if we didn't have the railroad here, you wouldn't be able to get enough trucks in over the road infrastructure that they have.
When the United States mobilized to fight in World War II, Stockton's port facility became an integral part of the war effort. The United States Army took over the port of Stockton and it became the largest vehicle and parts consignment center in the entire United States. The harbor overflowed with 10,000 workers, loading merchant vessels and assembling as many as 125 ships for the war effort, from tugs to minesweepers. In 1944, the United States Navy took over what was known as Rough and Ready Island and turned it into a naval complex. And uh, they would, the Navy held on to this area up until the year 2000 when Rough and Ready Island and all of its developments were turned over to the Port of Stockton. Rough and Ready Island tripled the size of the port overnight. It added warehousing and open land that the Port of Stockton never had before. The acquisition really helped us to be able to provide additional space for tenants to develop their own projects. Yara North America chose this location for its central location in the valley. We were able to lease a piece of the land here and build this facility and move our operation from another location that was less profitable and less convenient, so to speak. Keeps us competitive, keeps our costs down, and keeps us profitable, which is really what we're, we're, we're all about. The presence of global companies reflects the port's role in world commerce. Cargo crossing the docks has grown 176% in less than 10 years, making the port of Stockton the fourth busiest port in California. I've seen the port get extremely busy. I was working when there would be maybe a one ship every two, three weeks. Now we have two, three ships every day coming in. It's, it's just booming. While the port is responsive to world markets and international trade trends, it's also tied to the local community with a responsibility to its neighbors. Today, the port supports more than 10,000 jobs, what I like to call family wage jobs, to become a major part of the economic foundation of Stockton and the greater San Joaquin County area. The port actually makes a major contribution through tax revenues that go into every facet of every service that's provided by the city of Stockton or San Joaquin County. The port absolutely is part of the community. The waterway is not just only our, our ship channel. It is part of the Delta. It is part of the Pacific Flyway. It is a recreation area. It is a fishery. One of the latest commitments the port has made is we have joined the Green Marine Program. It looks at how ports and how uh, maritime operations are being handled to uh, reduce your impacts on the environment. At Antioch Dunes National Wildlife Refuge, we are working to restore the habitat for three species by placing sand material that comes out of our dredging each year. It's been an extremely successful project. The owls were here when we took over Rough and Ready. You know, the rodents like to uh, burrow holes in our levees, and we use the owls, the, the Air Force, if you want to call them, to uh, come in and reduce the rodent population. This wonderful group, Puentes, came to us, and they wanted to develop a community garden. And we thought it was a wonderful idea. We belong to a church in Sacramento, and a lot of the people are elderly and are really in need. So we thought once we start harvesting, we'll go and like bless people so that way the people that can't get out, they'll have their fresh veggies delivered right to them. The power of one little seed to help people live more sustainable lives. Yeah, that's our goal. It could be asked, what's a maritime port got to do with community gardening? or saving endangered species, or running a tiny service railroad, or any of a host of novel undertakings. It's being innovative. It's being responsive. It's being unique. But then a bustling port 75 miles inland from the coast is unique. That's the port of Stockton, 
cast in a different mold from its start as a gold rush depot upriver doing what's needed to meet the challenges of its times, the responsibilities as a community leader, and embracing the prospects for a bright future. Back in 2006, we started uh, building and installing barn owl nest boxes uh, to enhance the, the barn owl population here at the port. We put cameras in the boxes, put the images up on our website. I think we had 40,000 hits on our website just on the owls in one month last year. The public went absolutely crazy for it. We would post regular updates on the port's Facebook page, and we got many, many, many responses, lots of interested viewers. Absolutely beautiful animals. They, they've got a big white disc uh, of their face that actually helps channel light and, and sound. So when they're out hunting at night, they are able to uh, locate their prey. The islands here are all surrounded by levees. To maintain the integrity of those levees, it's pretty important that you, that you keep rodents from, from burrowing and digging holes. These owls can eat up to 3,000 rodents in a, in a single breeding season. So uh, they're, they're quite an effective method of rodent control. To our knowledge, we have increased the population quite a bit. This particular box behind me last year um, housed seven owlets. They all survived to, uh, to fledging, which is somewhat rare. A typical brood is, is more in the neighborhood of four or five, but we have 16 of these boxes at the port, and so you do the math, there's a, there's, there's a significant number of owlets being reared. I guess it's like the field of dreams. Build it and they will come because uh, they were here in short order and this, this particular box has been in use every year since 2006. The point of the owl box program is to reduce pesticide use, protect our levees, and in the meantime, now we've got a, a great project we can also share with the public that creates interaction. Uh, the port wants to do everything they can to 
enhance the environment and, uh, and support local wildlife. In 1845, when Charles Weber acquired a 49,000-acre parcel from his luckless business partner in exchange for paying off his grocery bill, he couldn't have anticipated what awaited him three years later. During the gold rush, Argonauts could come to Stockton en route to what were known as the Southern Mines. But the principal um, artery for transportation and the fastest way to travel was via water. There was no Stockton in those early days. There was Charles Weber's tent town on the San Joaquin River that served as a jumping off point for the gold fields. He realized that the San Joaquin River was going to be the principal aid in developing his city and Charles Weber was able to attract enough business people to establish hotels and restaurants and freight companies, and they would cater to the wants and needs of the miners. Uh, those who did not make their fortune, uh, in many instances, had been farmers in their previous lives. And coming back into Stockton or Sacramento, took a look around the Central Valley and realized there was great agricultural potential. We're in San Joaquin County. This is the most productive agricultural area really in the world. You grow corn, wheat, almonds, walnuts, fruit, a whole host of different commodities feeding the world. You couldn't have the unique agricultural environment we have without the river. That is what allowed this state to, to turn from a gold mining state, if you will, uh, to a food state. California's Central Valley is blessed with the best soil there is. Back then, the problem was less about growing the food than it was getting it to market. Without a statewide railroad system or even decent roads, Stockton was in a strategic position to be a hub, connecting the valley by river to San Francisco. From gold rush days, riverboats carried passengers and cargo on a daily basis between Stockton, Sacramento, and San Francisco. With the Central Pacific Railroad's completion of a branch line in 1869, connecting Stockton with the Transcontinental Railroad, the city's vision as a trade and transportation hub began to materialize, except for one critical issue. There were rather tortuous waterways leading from San Francisco to Stockton, weaving and turning through the islands. And because of hydraulic mining, there was a lot of sedimentation of these river areas, and so it was becoming rather shallow. In addition, ships were getting larger with deeper drafts, leaving the river's shallow depth a barrier to ocean-going vessels. If the region was going to grow with the times, it had to tame the twisting passage through the delta. Even though no single individual gets credit for proposing a dredged shipping channel, it was Lieutenant Colonel Barton Stone Alexander who drew up the plan in 1870 that showed it was feasible. They kind of choked at the projected $8 million price tag of such a ship canal. And so it continued to be a festering problem for the city of Stockton being cut off from that ocean-going transportation. Other countries hungered for California products, not just grains, nuts, and cotton, 
but manufactured goods too. The opportunity for trade was undeniable. When a product moves and how it moves is all dependent on where the destination is. The ship behind me is actually loading rice that's going to Japan. Rice would not be able to get to Japan if it didn't use port facilities because it doesn't make the economic sense to ship the kind of tonnage that one ship can hold in another way, like say, maybe in an aircraft. Stockton's residents remained convinced their future lay in a navigable ship channel. So in 1925, they passed a $3 million bond toward its construction. The state and feds later added more funds that finally set the project in motion. Work began in 1930. Dredges began removing millions of cubic yards of river bottom. Clamshell dredges piled the mud and rock to make levees that formed the new channel, opening acres of Delta Islands for farmland. Despite the Great Depression and Hitler's rise in Germany, in Stockton, church bells rang and automobile horns blared. It was 1933, and more than a thousand people celebrated the arrival of the Daisy Gray, the first deep draft vessel to arrive at Stockton's new port using the new channel. It was the start of a new era. The local responsibility was to develop the facilities. So they developed the docks, the warehousing, the rail connection, many of which we're actually still using today. In my opinion, uh, rail facilities are just as important to the success of a port as a dock. Central California Traction Company has been in business for more than 100 years. We are a uh, small railroad that basically does all the railroad switching on the Port of Stockton, and we're going all day long. We get rail cars from two major railroads, Burlington Northern and Union Pacific, and we get those cars, separate them all out, take them to the customers, let them unload them or load them, and then take them back and give them to those class one railroads. The port is a busy place. And they've got ships coming in, they've got trucks coming in. And if we didn't have the railroad here, you wouldn't be able to get enough trucks in over the road infrastructure that they have. When the United States mobilized to fight in World War II, Stockton's port facility became an integral part of the war effort. The United States Army took over the port of Stockton and it became the largest vehicle and parts consignment center in the entire United States. The harbor overflowed with 10,000 workers, loading merchant vessels and assembling as many as 125 ships for the war effort, from tugs to minesweepers. In 1944, the United States Navy took over what was known as Rough and Ready Island and turned it into a naval complex. And uh, they would, the Navy held on to this area up until the year 2000 when Rough and Ready Island and all of its developments were turned over to the Port of Stockton. Rough and Ready Island tripled the size of the port overnight. It added warehousing and open land that the Port of Stockton never had before. The acquisition really helped us to be able to provide additional space for tenants to develop their own projects. Yara North America chose this location for its central location in the valley. We were able to lease a piece of the land here and build this facility and move our operation from another location that was less profitable and less convenient, so to speak. Keeps us competitive, keeps our costs down, and keeps us profitable, which is really what we're, we're, we're all about. The presence of global companies reflects the port's role in world commerce. Cargo crossing the docks has grown 176% in less than 10 years, making the port of Stockton the fourth busiest port in California. I've seen the port get extremely busy. I was working when there would be maybe a one ship every two, three weeks. Now we have two, three ships every day coming in. It's, it's just booming. 
While the port is responsive to world markets and international trade trends, it's also tied to the local community with a responsibility to its neighbors. Today, the port supports more than 10,000 jobs, what I like to call family wage jobs, to become a major part of the economic foundation of Stockton and the greater San Joaquin County area. The port actually makes a major contribution through tax revenues that go into every facet of every service that's provided by the city of Stockton or San Joaquin County. The port absolutely is part of the community. The waterway is not just only our, our ship channel. It is part of the Delta. It is part of the Pacific Flyway. It is a recreation area. It is a fishery. One of the latest commitments the port has made is we have joined the Green Marine Program. It looks at how ports and how uh, maritime operations are being handled to uh, reduce your impacts on the environment. At Antioch Dunes National Wildlife Refuge, we are working to restore the habitat for three species by placing sand material that comes out of our dredging each year. It's been an extremely successful project. The owls were here when we took over Rough and Ready. You know, the rodents like to uh, burrow holes in our levees, and we use the owls, the, the Air Force, if you want to call them, to uh, come in and reduce the rodent population. This wonderful group, Puentes, came to us, and they wanted to develop a community garden. And we thought it was a wonderful idea. We belong to a church in Sacramento, and a lot of the people are elderly and are really in need. So we thought once we start harvesting, we'll go and like bless people so that way the people that can't get out, they'll have their fresh veggies delivered right to them. The power of one little seed to help people live more sustainable lives. Yeah, that's our goal. It could be asked, what's a maritime port got to do with community gardening? or saving endangered species, or running a tiny service railroad, or any of a host of novel undertakings. It's being innovative. It's being responsive. It's being unique. But then a bustling port 75 miles inland from the coast is unique. That's the Port of Stockton, cast in a different mold from its start as a gold rush depot upriver, doing what's needed to meet the challenges of its times the responsibilities as a community leader, and embracing the prospects for a bright future.
Back in 2006, we started uh, building and installing barn owl nest boxes uh, to enhance the, the barn owl population here at the port. We put cameras in the boxes, put the images up on our website. I think we had 40,000 hits on our website just on the owls in one month last year. The public went absolutely crazy for it. We would post regular updates on the port's Facebook page and we got many, many, many responses, lots of interested viewers. Absolutely beautiful animals. They, they've got a big white disc uh, of their face that actually helps channel light and, and sound. So when they're out hunting at night, they are able to uh, locate their prey. The islands here are all surrounded by levees. To maintain the integrity of those levees, it's pretty important that you, that you keep rodents from, from burrowing and digging holes. These owls can eat up to 3,000 rodents in a, in a single breeding season. So uh, they're, they're quite an effective method of rodent control. To our knowledge, we have increased the population quite a bit. This particular box behind me last year um, housed seven owlets. They all survived to, uh, to fledging, which is somewhat rare. A typical brood is, is more in the neighborhood of four or five but we have 16 of these boxes at the port, and so you do the math, there's a, there's, there's a significant number of owlets being reared. I, I guess it's like the field of dreams. Build it and they will come, because uh, they, they were here in short order, and this, this particular box has been in use every year since 2006. The point of the owl box program is to reduce pesticide use, protect our levees, and in the meantime, now we've got a, a great project we can also share with the public that creates interaction. Uh, the port wants to do everything they can to enhance the environment and, uh, and support local wildlife. In 1845, when Charles Weber acquired a 49,000-acre parcel from his luckless business partner in exchange for paying off his grocery bill, he couldn't have anticipated what awaited him three years later. During the gold rush, Argonauts could come to Stockton en route to what were known as the Southern Mines. But the principal um, artery for transportation, and the fastest way to travel was via water. There was no Stockton in those early days. There was Charles Weber's tent town on the San Joaquin River that served as a jumping off point for the gold fields. He realized that the San Joaquin River was going to be the principal aid in developing his city, and Charles Weber was able to attract enough business people to establish hotels and restaurants and freight companies, and they would cater to the wants and needs of the miners. Uh, those who did not make their fortune, uh, in many instances, had been farmers in their previous lives. And coming back into Stockton or Sacramento, took a look around the Central Valley and realized there was great agricultural potential. We're in San Joaquin County. This is the most productive agricultural area really in the world. You grow corn, wheat, almonds, walnuts, fruit, a whole host of different commodities feeding the world. You couldn't have the unique agricultural environment we have without the river. That is what allowed this state to, to turn from a gold mining state, if you will, 
uh, to a food state. California's Central Valley is blessed with the best soil there is. Back then, the problem was less about growing the food than it was getting it to market. Without a statewide railroad system or even decent roads, Stockton was in a strategic position to be a hub, connecting the valley by river to San Francisco. From gold rush days, riverboats carried passengers and cargo on a daily basis between Stockton, Sacramento, and San Francisco. With the Central Pacific Railroad's completion of a branch line in 1869, connecting Stockton with the Transcontinental Railroad, the city's vision as a trade and transportation hub began to materialize, except for one critical issue. There were rather tortuous waterways leading from San Francisco to Stockton, weaving and turning through the islands. And because of hydraulic mining, there was a lot of sedimentation of these river areas, and so it was becoming rather shallow. In addition, ships were getting larger with deeper drafts, leaving the river's shallow depth a barrier to ocean-going vessels. If the region was going to grow with the times, it had to tame the twisting passage through the delta. Even though no single individual gets credit for proposing a dredged shipping channel, it was Lieutenant Colonel Barton Stone Alexander who drew up the plan in 1870 that showed it was feasible they kind of choked at the projected $8 million price tag of such a uh, ship canal. And so it continued to be a festering problem for the city of Stockton, being cut off from that ocean-going transportation. Other countries hungered for California products, not just grains, nuts, and cotton, but manufactured goods too. The opportunity for trade was undeniable. When a product moves, and how it moves, is all dependent on where the destination is. The ship behind me is actually loading rice that's going to Japan. Rice would not be able to get to Japan if it didn't use port facilities, because it doesn't make the economic sense to ship the kind of tonnage that one ship can hold in another way, like, say, maybe in an aircraft. Stockton's residents remained convinced their future lay in a navigable ship channel. So in 1925, they passed a $3 million bond toward its construction. The state and feds later added more funds that finally set the project in motion. Work began in 1930. Dredges began removing millions of cubic yards of river bottom. Clamshell dredges piled the mud and rock to make levees that formed the new channel, opening acres of Delta Islands for farmland. Despite the Great Depression and Hitler's rise in Germany, in Stockton, church bells rang and automobile horns blared. It was 1933, and more than a thousand people celebrated the arrival of the Daisy Gray, the first deep draft vessel to arrive at Stockton's new port using the new channel. It was the start of a new era. The local responsibility was to develop the facilities. So they developed the docks, the warehousing, the rail connection, many of which we're actually still using today. In my opinion, uh, rail facilities are just as important to the success of a port as a dock. Central California Traction Company has been in business for more than 100 years. We are a uh, small railroad that basically does all the railroad switching on the Port of Stockton, and we're going all day long. We get rail cars from two major railroads, Burlington Northern and Union Pacific, and we get those cars, separate them all out, take them to the customers, let them unload them or load them, and then take them back and give them to those class one railroads. The port is a busy place. I mean, they've got ships coming in, they've got trucks coming in. 
and if we didn't have the railroad here you wouldn't be able to get enough trucks in over the road infrastructure that they have when the united states mobilized to fight in world war ii stockton's port facility became an integral part of the war effort the united states army took over the port of stockton and it became the largest vehicle and parts consignment center in the entire United States. The harbor overflowed with 10,000 workers, loading merchant vessels and assembling as many as 125 ships for the war effort, from tugs to minesweepers. In 1944, the United States Navy took over what was known as Rough and Ready Island and turned it into a naval complex and uh, they would, the Navy held on to this area up until the year 2000 when Rough and Ready Island and all of its developments were turned over to the Port of Stockton. Rough and Ready Island tripled the size of the port overnight. It added warehousing and open land that the Port of Stockton never had before. The acquisition really helped us to be able to provide additional space for tenants to develop their own projects. Yara, North America, chose this location for its central location in the valley. We were able to lease a piece of the land here and build this facility and move our operation from another location that was less profitable and less convenient, so to speak. Keeps us competitive, keeps our costs down, and keeps us profitable, which is really what we're, we're all about. The presence of global companies reflects the port's role in world commerce. Cargo crossing the docks has grown 176% in less than 10 years, making the port of Stockton the fourth busiest port in California. I've seen the port get extremely busy. I was working when there would be maybe a one ship every two, three weeks. Now we have two, three ships every day coming in. It's, it's just booming. While the port is responsive to world markets and international trade trends, it's also tied to the local community with a responsibility to its neighbors. Today, the port supports more than 10,000 jobs, what I like to call family wage jobs, to become a major part of the economic foundation of Stockton and the greater San Joaquin County area. The port actually makes a major contribution through tax revenues that go into every facet of every service that's provided by the city of Stockton or San Joaquin County. The port absolutely is part of the community. The waterway is not just only our, our ship channel. It is part of the Delta. It is part of the Pacific Flyway. It is a recreation area. It is a fishery. One of the latest commitments the port has made is we have joined the Green Marine Program. It looks at how ports and how uh, maritime operations are being handled to uh, reduce your impacts on the environment. At Antioch Dunes National Wildlife Refuge, we are working to restore the habitat for three species by placing sand material that comes out of our dredging each year. It's been an extremely successful project. The owls were here when we took over Rough and Ready. You know, the rodents like to uh, burrow holes in our levees, and we use the owls, the, the Air Force, if you want to call them.
Ready? We are out of closed session and there is no reportable actions. And so do we have a motion to adjourn? Move. We do. I'd like to the motion in a second. Before that, we'd like to uh, adjourn today's uh, meeting in memory of Alberta Deernick, the beloved mother of IT systems director, engineer, uh, Tim Deernick. Mrs. Deernick, age 94, passed away on March 8th, 2022. She was born on December 24th, 1927 in Stockton. Alberta graduated from Stockton High School. She took great pride and joy in her 10 children, and it was even crowned San Joaquin Homemaker of the Year in 1965. She was a faithful parishioner of St. Bernadette's Church, volunteered teaching catechism, and helped with bookkeeping at her husband's business, John Falls Men's Shop. She later began working as a food clerk at Safeway for nearly 20 years. In her spare time, Alberta enjoyed family water skiing trips on the Delta, swimming with silver uh, aqua nuts at UOP, and even played in a ladies' poker club. She is survived by her children Patricia Jacquez, Nancy Travis, Sally Kessler, Mary Spring, Joan Bernadette Jones, Thomas Deernick, Timothy Deernick, Charles Deernick, Laura Martini, 22 grandchildren, and 11 great-grandchildren. On behalf of the commissioners, port director, and staff, we sin our sincere sympathies and condolences are extended to the family of Alberta Deernick. Wow. Green plus Deernick. Thank you. Yeah. She went to high school with my dad. Wow. Yeah. And she was in retail clerks with my father-in-law. Yeah. You know what? I bet you she did with my dad, too, because my dad would be 93 right now, and he went to Stockton High School. Yeah.